So welcome to Rob uh, 501. Um, unfortunately, we have not been able to get everyone in the course who wants in the course. Um, I guess that speaks highly for the, what you're expecting to learn. About half of you are in here because it's required, but the other half, it's optional, totally optional. Um, so, whoops, don't go away. Come back, come back, talk to me. <laughs> okay, so if you're just course surfing, please make a decision as soon as possible so that we can get the other students in. That's all I ask, but you're all welcome. You're in here for a reason to learn math. Um, if you haven't been on the course website, it's on the home page that we do theorems and proofs every single day, even today, and we never see anything practical on a robot, okay? So I just want to make it clear, this is mathematical methods, it's just what it is. If you're looking for something else, we don't have it here. I just, sorry about that. Um, life is hard, so. Truth in advertising, uh, you'll be happier, I'll be happier, etc. My handwriting isn't very good. You can see the, what's handwriting and what's uh, not, I guess. Um, I do my best. It'll get a little bit better in the next week or two after I get back in, back in the saddle, just like you for courses. So in order for us to write down proofs and do things carefully, we need some good notation. We're gonna, these first, this first week is super simple. It's super simple. Um, it's just reviewing how you do logical arguments. Now, if it's the first time you've seen it, it's maybe not so much simple, but I think it's, if you judge this week as the level of difficulty, that is not truth in advertising either. That's all, that's all I'm really saying here, okay? So just first some uh, notation. Normally, we're used to talking about the integers, but every once in a while, we'll care about the natural numbers. So they're, they're also called the counting numbers. So that's this capital N here, and it starts at one. There will never be an exam question where you fail if you think zero is a natural number, because it seems pretty natural to me too, okay? But it's not, okay? There are definitions, zero is not a natural number. Um, the integers have all the neg negative natural numbers and zero and then the natural numbers. So they're called the integers or the whole numbers. The rational numbers, those are ratios of integers such that the denominator is not zero. Okay, so that's the rational numbers. Um, the key thing is no common factors. So that means if you have 3 over 12, you've written it as 1 over 4, okay? So reduce all of the common things to get the unique representation of a rational number. The real numbers are actually super, super difficult to define and we will not be able to develop them in this course, believe it or not, okay? So you've been using the real numbers, et cetera, but they are, um, they are not easy. They're actually limits of rational numbers, and so you have to know what a limit is, et cetera. So they're actually an equivalence class of Cauchy sequences. Ooh, okay, there's a lot of big words there. Uh, we will not get into the construction of the real numbers. If you take math 451, you will learn about the um, real numbers. We need the complex numbers simply because eigenvalues of matrices can be complex. So if you have roots of polynomials, they're not always real, even if the coefficients are real. So we need the complex numbers. And so they are a real number plus j times another real number, where j has the property that its square is equal to minus one. So you can think about them as two tuples, but we equivalently write them as a real part and an imaginary part. Everybody understanding me so far? Okay, I'm from Oklahoma. I speak a little bit more slowly than 
a lot of people, but I think that's okay. Okay, so that's been pretty easy. So here's going to get into our first quantifiers to help us write down um, logical statements. So <clears throat> this upside down A means for every, or for each, or for all. So whenever you see it, it, depending upon how you're constructing the sentence, you would use one of these words, okay? Phrases. This backwards E means there exists, or there is some, or for some, or for at least one, okay? And then this, which will often look like an epsilon because I don't make my epsilons and my element of symbols very distinct. I think a lot of people are guilty about that. But that means you're an element of something, like X is an element of A, or M and Q are elements of the integers, okay? So that's the element sign. So it's just some simple uh, symbols, and so what I want to do first is just write down an English phrase, and then we'll translate that into symbols. Okay, I can see several of you are just totally thrilled. I, I get the look, okay. Um, <clears throat> let's do this one. Every non-zero real number has a multiplicative inverse. Okay, so that's our statement in English. Every non-zero real number has a multiplicative inverse. So every is the upside down A, okay? So here's one way to write this. Oh, it's not very dark, I don't like that. For every real number X, X not equal to zero, <coughs> Every real number x, now this one is a little bit tricky, has means there exists, okay? For every real number x, x not equal to zero, there exists another number y in the real numbers such that x times y equals one. So by definition of the real numbers, y is a multiplicative inverse of x if their product is equal to the unit one, okay? So there would be, um, <clears throat> now, it's obvious the choice of y depends upon x. Let me write it out like that. If you change x, it has a different inverse, okay? Choice of y depends on x. So, <clears throat> it's super apparent here, but other times we might tend to forget that the element we're choosing here is allowed to depend upon everything that comes before it, okay? So that's, it's just always important to keep in mind. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, questions on that? That's just, that one worked? Oh, we're not indicating at all because it comes, how do we indicate it? We indicate it because it comes after this. Sometimes we might write y as a function of x or depends upon x. But that would, sometimes that notation gets very heavy, so we don't do it. There'll be other times when I will, okay? Here's another one. Wow, I don't like that either. 
Why are my colors not dark? Well, maybe I didn't choose the right pen. Size, plus, Let's see if that one, every, yeah. I chose the wrong pen to set my things up. Every real number X can be arbitrarily closely approximated by a rational number. Okay. Kind of sad. One of the more one of the more important words in here is the lightest one. Okay, but every. Okay, so that's our upside down A. So this will start out for every x in the reals. Okay. What do we mean that we can approximate it arbitrarily closely? That's one way to write it, okay? Any other ways? Let's use our integers, our natural, our counting numbers. Let's see if, how you like this, okay? For every x in the reals and for every n, in the counting number, so n is bigger than or equal to 1, there exists q in the rationals such that the distance from x to q is less than 1 over n. So I'm just choosing my epsilon to be 1 over n, okay? Now, this is what's really important. As I change the level of approximation, guess what? Q has to change, okay? So Q is a function of N. It's very clearly a function of N. So, example, X equals pi. I take N equals... Um, 1, I can take Q equals 3.1, for example, okay? Pi minus 3.1 is 0 0.04, blah, 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 which is less than 1 over 1. In fact, I could take N equals 10 in that case. Um, if I take n equals, um, say, 100, maybe I need to take a couple more digits, okay? So as I change n, the degree of precision, q changes, okay? q varies with N. <clears throat> okay, so what I want you to make a, a note of in your uh, lecture notes is when you see the exist sign, whatever follows depends on anything that's coming ahead of it. This is setting up the conditions for which under this condition this thing exists, so it depends on what came in front of it. So these examples are maybe a little too simple to drive it in, but they're a way to get started, and we'll see that over and over and over. Question, yes? Oh, yeah, I mean, I could say there exists an integer, but if I choose my integer to be 
No, it's not true, because if I choose my integer to be minus 1, then there's no real number that's less than minus 1. So there would not exist a cube. It would be false. If I take a smaller thing than this, like the even numbers, yeah, because I could just put an 1 over 2n, and it's still true. OK, so it goes the other way. OK, <clears throat> cool. No questions? We'll do a little bit more notation, more examples, more notation, more examples. And, OK. Bingo. OK, some more notation. Um, when I'm writing the not of a statement, so we, we're doing things like P implies Q, and not Q implies not P, the not part. So not of true is false, not of false is true, OK? Often I'll write it with a tilde. In, all, in a lot of the books now, you see this kind of funny wedge thing as the not, OK? So you'll see both. <clears throat> OK, so P implies Q means that if P is true, Q is true. If P is false, Q could be true or false. We don't, we don't know, OK? But P true implies Q true. That's what P implies Q means. P if and only if Q. P implies Q and Q implies P. So P is true if and only if Q is true. And that's the same thing as the arrows go in both directions. So when you've got the double arrow, it's logically equivalent. You can break this statement up into an and. P implies Q and Q implies P. Okay. So a square matrix with determinant not equal to zero and the matrix having an inverse. Those are equivalent. Okay. Um, a matrix having an inverse implies that it is square. However, a matrix being square does not necessarily imply that it has an inverse. It could be the zero matrix, okay? So that's what's um, going on there, just for notation. So we'll typically write P implies Q like that. Um, this is vocabulary that put a star by it because this is much more important than is zero a counting number or not, okay? You will never miss a point for zero a counting number or not, but you will miss points for the difference between the contrapositive and the converse. So this is important vocabulary. Let's put a star by these, okay? The contrapositive of P implies Q is Q false implies P false, not Q implies not P. Okay, that's the contrapositive. The converse is of P implies Q is Q implies P. <clears throat> that's the converse. So these we need to keep straight. So that's probably the first vocabulary that you're really um, going to be held accountable for. Everything else you may have seen before. And this you've seen, but you forgot it. OK, it's just simple. You just forgot it. Okay. So, And this is the negation of Q. So when Q is false, not Q is true, this true implies this true, so that means the not of the true is that P is false. <clears throat> We're good? Notation? We love it. Okay. I can move on? Yay! Okay. So some of this is, once again, vocabulary as well, but it'll be good practice. And so
so direct proof. Okay, so what this means is we derive a result by applying the rules of logic to the given assumptions definitions and known theorems. Okay, so on your first homework, there's the word show, S-H-O-W. Show means prove, okay? So, whoops, uh, I'll fix all these. So in homework one, every time you're asked to show something, all it means is calculate what is on the left-hand side in terms of some matrices Calculate what is on the right-hand side and show that they're equal. It's a direct proof. It's just pure calculation. Okay, homework one, they're all direct proofs. And so homework one, which is due a week from Thursday, because some of you are joining, not unjoining and everything, it is working on matrix facts that we will need. It's, it's just matrices. It doesn't require anything we've done in class, but I'll get lots of questions about how do I prove something, and really is the left-hand side has some symbols, the right-hand side has some symbols. They involve matrix multiplication or vector times of multiplication, and you just show when you multiply them that the IJ entry here and the IJ entry there are the same. That's all you do, okay? Nothing more. It's no more complicated than that. So that's, that's as direct as you can be. Okay, so let's do some examples of this. Example, so we'll make our first former, for, formal definition. An integer n is even if n can be written as 2 times k for some integer k. Okay, it can be written as a factor of 2 and It is odd otherwise. Okay. In very important remark. Okay, so this is a question of mathematical style. In a definition, when you see if, it actually means if and only if, okay? The mathematicians got tired of writing if and only if every time, and so they said, in a definition, if means if and only if, okay? So in a definition, if 
equals if and only if. Okay, so it's only true in a definition. It is not true in a theorem or corollary or any place else, okay? In a proof, it's only in a definition that that is true. How do you specify the if in a definition? There is none. There is none. <laughs> Never. Never. Yes. You know, the question was, how could you do the not if and only if? No, it, it's, a, it's a definition. Definitions are setting equivalences between quantities. That's really what they're doing. They're axioms. They're, they're adding to the set of axioms to remove all of this complication by replacing it with the word even. That's all it's doing. It's setting up axioms. It's setting, giving you other logical things. Okay. Proposition. Bingo. Uh, what do I want to show? Um, the sum of two odd integers is even, okay? So I could have said claim, I could have said theorem. How you choose depends upon your state of mind. It doesn't really matter that much for us, okay? Propositions are less important things. Theorem should be really important, man, it's got it, yeah. Okay, but the sum of two odd integers is even, doesn't seem to rise to that level. That's all, okay, so it's nothing more, nothing more than that. Ah, driving me crazy. Pen, blue, size two, add, there. I've got a dark blue pen. So our proof is going to be direct. So really what we're going to be doing is using the definition of what it means that an integer is odd and the rules of adding integers. That's all we're going to do. That's direct. Okay. So let A and B be two odd integers. Okay, so because these integers are odd, I cannot write them as n equals 2 times k. I can only write them as 2k plus 1. Okay? Hence, it's... The 2k plus 1, like this implies that we have to write as 2k plus 1. Yeah, you could do all of that, but we're not going to. Cause it's so simple. Yeah, that's all. Hence, there exist two integers, k1 and k2, such that a is odd, whoops, hit the erase, 2k1 plus 1, and b is odd, 2k2 plus 1. Okay, so we've, we've used the definition of not even, they're odd. Okay, so now we're just going to use the definitions of arithmetic with integers. A plus B, 2K1 plus 1, 2K2 plus 1 equals... 2k1 plus 2k2 plus 2. And then the coup de grace, 
the final blow that takes out this direct proof is I factor out the two. Okay, now this is even because K1 plus K2 plus 1 is an integer. If we have 100 people and they all ask 10 questions, so just let's talk after class, but we just have to be parsimonious, okay? It's just the only way it works with 100. Now, I love questions, but I just need to spread them around. Okay, so, um, so we factor out the two, and then this is from the piano-baker hypotheses that define the integers, etc. So this is assuming you've had basic stuff. So now, if you were writing a scientific paper and you tried to prove something like this, they would just laugh at you, okay? Totally just laugh at you. So it's always a question of judgment how many details you put in, which is kind of what you're getting at here. So I'm just putting in enough details to give you guys an idea that, yes, we actually did check the definition by writing it as two times an integer and why it's an integer. So that's all. Just trying to uh, do that. Okay? Okay. Questions on a direct proof? Are they all that easy? <laughs> no. But, that's, but you get the idea that you really, you're really you using the definitions and some very simple properties about the elements you have. Like you know they're integers, and there are theorems that say you add two integers, you get an integer. It's the axioms that define the integers. So if you guys are proving something about matrices, you can use known theorems about matrices. You can use the definition of matrix multiplication that it's this row times this column to get the ij element over here. You use those properties in homework one. You just use those types of things. Okay, so here's the, another one. Ah, that's driving me crazy too. I really set up my pens all wrong. Uh, oh. Bingo. Oh, I already had one, huh? I'll get rid of the bad ones. Proof by contradiction. Proof by contradiction. Excuse me, contrapositive. I'm wrong. See? This important vocabulary, contrapositive. I even messed it up. It's not a contradiction. We'll do that one Thursday. Proof by contrapositive. To establish P implies Q, we show instead that not Q implies not P. Okay? These are logically equivalent. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so here's our proposition. N be an integer. If N squared is even, then N is even. Okay, so that says if you have 11, you can't write it as the product of two even numbers, okay? So, let's do the proof. 
We want to do P implies Q, so let's identify P. P is that N squared is even. We want to show it implies that the original integer itself was even. Okay, so if P is that N squared is even, not P is that N squared is odd, okay? And similarly, not Q is that N is odd. Now I'm giving away a big secret here. Half of the proofs that you will ever do will actually fall apart if you just write down what you know, okay? It's true. Mostly you get, you don't know where to start because you never really write down what you are trying to show. What is my hypothesis P? What is my conclusion Q? If you just write it down, you're almost always halfway there in a course like this. It's rare that you're going to have to do 17 lines to get there. 16 for sure, okay, rarely seven, no, okay. So just, it's always, just write it down, okay. So now, what we do is, we're doing a direct proof on not Q implies not P. So once we've written down the contrapositive, it's now a direct proof again. But in, here's my new P tilde, if you want to think about it that way, and here's my new Q. It's now direct in this, okay? So we want to show N odd, N odd implies N squared odd, okay? That's what we're trying to show. So what does it mean that N is odd? That means there exists something in the integers such that N equals 2K plus 1. Okay, so like I said, direct proofs, I need to apply, you know, all my definitions and known theorems. So here's my definition of odd. Now I need to write down what is n squared, n squared. So it's 2k plus 1 squared. So that's 4k squared plus 4k. plus one. Okay, you think I can write it as two times an integer plus one? Uh, let's see, two carry the one, divide by seven, um, okay. Okay, plus one is odd. Oh, my handwriting is really falling apart because k squared plus k is an integer. Oh, uh, 2k squared and 2 here, sorry. I said carry the 1, divide by 6, and I started my brain shut off, okay? So if you do that, the whole problem's absolutely wrong. No points. <laughs> no. I do it. There's no points, okay? That's for sure, okay? I do it, there's no points. You get all, you get all sorts of partial credit, yes. Especially if you write down, oh, I need to write down 2k squared plus 2k is an integer. There we go. Okay, so that's, that's a um, proof by contrapositive. Questions on that? Nobody else has one, so I guess I, I guess I have to draw. 
You'll be my, my backup guy. Hey, we got a question. Uh, like in your head, what goes through your head when you say, oh, this is going to be easier to do the contrapositive Yeah, that's so how to, how to know which proof technique to apply is the question. And that takes, um, that takes practice. In the homeworks, this is what you'll see is that, you know, there's the problems and then there's a totally separate page where I give hints. And so I'll give you hints on those types of things. Um, so that'll help out. Um, so I often try multiple ways. And then, you know, when I'm a professional, so I'm not trying to prove something that is already known to be true because somebody else's name on that. And so, you know, I'm saying something is true, but then you know, if I can't prove it, I start trying to prove that that thing's false. And then I go backwards and forth until I iterate to something I can't establish or say, hey, that was not really a smart idea. It's totally wrong. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's like in sports. How do I know which, which, which play to call, you know? It's, it's really the same uh, intuition. I think the defense was expecting this, you know? The, the mathematical gods were expecting this. I'm going to do the end around. We've got them, okay? They were coming in uh, after the quarterback. So I hate to be flippant, but it's really, um, for me, it's an art still. I like the question. It's fun. Okay. Um, proof by exhaustion. Whoa. It's a technique, okay? Um, so the, the four color problem was proven that way. They did really heavy math to reduce it to some 400 and something thousand, a finite number of cases, I forget how many. And then they wrote a computer program to go through and check every single one of them. So that's, that's a proof by exhaustion. Ah, I'm going to throw you away, but I'll do that tomorrow. Reduce the proof to a finite number of cases. And check every one of them, okay? Okay, so surprise, surprise, we don't do very many of those. Um, I mean, we'll have two cases or three. It will never be 611 of them, and I'm going day after day, man. We're at 408, okay? You guys ready for the next one, 409? It's not gonna happen, okay? <laughs> Neither on homework nor, nor, nor in class, okay? But it is an a, a, um, admitted method of proof. And once again, the famous four color problem. If you don't know what four color problem, go to Wikipedia. It's super cool. Um, was done as a proof by exhaustion with some really fancy uh, algebra, et cetera. Okay, so here's finally getting to the one that you guys know and hate. Oh, please. Not gonna go away, okay. Proofs by induction. <clears throat> so we're gonna do two styles. Um, we'll do the basic one. And then we'll do something that's called the second principle of induction. So, first principle this is sometimes called standard. Induction. So it's probably, it's probably the one that you know. Um, so here it is. The P of N
be a statement about the counting numbers. following properties. Okay, so counting numbers were minus 18, minus 19, no. Zero, one, two, no. One, two, three, four, okay. Okay, A, base case, P of 1 is true, B, for K bigger than 1, if P of K is true, then P of K plus 1 is true. Okay, we'll come back to that in just a second. Then P of N is true for all n greater than or equal to 1. OK, so the proof by induction is magical because you are asserting that an infinite number of things are true. And you're not doing an infinite number of operations to do that. So you're establishing a first case. And then you're establishing if it's true for k arbitrary, and I can show that that implies it's true for k plus 1, then I get everything. So it's magical. You get an infinite number of results for finite amount of work. Now, the biggest problem um, people have is they don't check the base case. They just immediately, they, and then they don't write down what their statement really is. So once again, if you write down what you're trying to show, it is so much easier. You'll find uh, the mistakes, okay? So here's, um, here's a claim that we'll make, claim. It's the formula for the sum, whoops, go away, of odd integers. Okay. And the claim is For all n greater than 1, 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus dot, 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 plus 2n minus 1 is equal to n squared. Okay, so we're adding up all of the odd numbers up to 2n minus 1. So when n is 1, it stops at 1. When n is 2, it stops at 3. When n is 10, it stops at 19. Okay. So, so that's the claim. So now we need to write down um, what is our statement about the integers. Okay. It's down here. 
P of N. It is simply what we have written up above here. One plus three plus five dot 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 plus two N minus one equals N squared. And this is true for N bigger than or equal to one. So this is a logical statement that is indexed by N. You have a different sum for every n. So base case. Okay. So do proof by induction. First write down what you're inducting over, integers n, and this formula holds. The base case, you check it for n equals 1. In this case, what are we checking? The sum up to 1 is equal to 1 squared. So, okay. so the base case, p of 1 holds because 1 equals 1 squared. So that's all we had to check. We just have to do this sum up to 2n minus 1, which is 1. And then we had to plug in the base case 1 and square it. Bingo. So that's the base case. Induction step. Okay. We assume P of K is true. P of k would be 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus dot, 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 2k minus 1 equals k squared. And we attempt to prove P of k plus 1 is also true. Okay, and I often don't do this, but let me just write down what is P of k plus 1? It's 1 plus 3. And it's 2 times k plus 1 minus 1 equals k plus 1 squared. Okay, let you get caught up, you know, your eyes are squinting, it's hot in here, and my handwriting is so bad, and you're trying to go, what set of symbols does that come from, sir? You know? Yes, Egyptian hieroglyphics, sorry. Okay, so, we wanna show, when we go up to k plus one, we get k plus one squared, assuming that if we had stopped at k, we know that we got k squared. How does the left-hand side of that one differ from the left-hand side of this one? What does this look like? It looks like P of K, right? Okay, so to get this one from this one, what if we add two times K plus one minus one to both sides? We know these things are equal. If x equals y, and I add x plus z and y plus z, that is still true, okay? So, we add 2 times k plus 1 minus 1. 
both sides of the statement for P of K. So this is how I'm going to use that P of K is true because I'm going to write down 1 plus 3 plus dot 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 plus 2 times K minus 1 plus 2 times and I've being extremely obvious that I've gone to k plus 1 by always replacing my k by k plus 1. I'm aware that um, I can simplify that, but I'm not doing it, okay? Oh, what am I doing? I've got my parentheses in the wrong spot. I'm just an idiot, okay? And you guys didn't tell me. You just let me be an idiot, okay? <laughs> you are so mean, okay? You're the first class that's done that to me ever to let me be so stupid, and it's all being filmed, okay? So this is the hard part, okay, guys? <laughs> <laughs> and I do not edit anything. I have no pride anymore because I've made lots of these stupid mistakes, okay? But it's much easier to prove when you actually copy down the correct hypotheses from that. And that's, of course, what I was trying to illustrate, okay? <laughs> oh, my God. Life is hard. Okay. So we add um, the correct thing to both sides, 2K plus 1 minus 1. There, we got it. Okay. So we add... Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah. No, oh, no, it's two times. I had it right the first time. I thought I made a mistake, but I was wrong. Okay. Okay. There we go. We add that quantity um, to both sides. Okay? So because P of K is true, we know that this is equal to K squared plus 2 times K plus 1 minus 1. Okay? Because... P plus K being true, you add up to here, you get K squared. And now I add the same quantity to both sides. By properties of the integers, I get the same thing. Okay. And then how can I write this? And now I'm going to hopefully do my arithmetic correctly. Oh, I got that part right. And that's k plus 1 squared, OK? So p of k true implies p of k plus 1 true. We just used p of k. We added the same quantity to both sides. So x equals y, x plus z equals y plus z. And then we established that p of k plus 1 is true. Hence, P of K implies P of K plus 1. And hence, P and of N is true for all N greater than or equal to 1. How are we doing? Hot? Yeah? I'm sweating up here. I need a fan, man. <clears throat> this is Michigan. It's supposed to be cool. <clears throat> uh, OK, I saw this one first, then we'll go. Yeah? Uh, Good. So we assume that P of K was true. Is mm -hmm. that because the base case was true? OK, so the question was how do you formulate a proof by induction? So you do two things. You first check a base case. Then you take a k arbitrary that's bigger than or equal to the base case. And then so you say, if p of k is true, you say if. Then, so now, now it becomes a direct proof. This is the p, and the q is the p of k plus 1. 
So now it's a direct proof on this one step here. It's if, then. If, then. That's a direct proof. Okay? Question. Oh, the box? Um, yeah, I like the boxes. You don't see QED in very many um, engineering journals. Sometimes they don't even put a box. They just put a period and start writing again, and you don't even know where the proof ended, okay? Um, so I won't always put a little box, but I tend to denote where my proof ended. Yeah, that was the question. Next one, yeah? Um, so induction, could you use induction for like one, three, five, seven, etc., and prove things about the odd yeah, integers? Yeah, so let me do a simplified version of that, okay? So question. Okay. What if you want to prove something is true for k0 bigger than or equal to 19? Okay. Oh my gosh. Induction doesn't work. Oh, come on, go back, please. Let's see. I got too excited. <laughs> Come on. Okay, because um, the induction says the base case has to be one. Okay. No. Okay. So, um, if you want induction for k bigger than or equal to uh, nineteen. Let P tilde of K um, equal P of K plus 18. Then do induction on P tilde of K. So For something this simple, everybody would just take the base case equals 19 and go, okay? It's considered a friendly amendment, okay? There's no, there's no contesting that. But if the case you really wanted were some complicated function, simply rewrite the P tilde in terms of one, two, three, four, and then this turns out to be um, K factorial, we don't care, you see? So just take and rewrite it in terms of consecutive um, natural numbers and you'll be good. In the same way, if you want to start at minus eight, that's, that's fine, okay? What doesn't work is going to infinity in both directions at the same time. So if you start out at minus 67,000 and go forward, it's okay. But you can't go forwards and backwards at the same time. Does that answer the question? Okay. Other questions? More, see if anybody in the back? Can you guys hear me back there? Okay. Oh, I use K and N. Yeah, see, this, this P of 1 is P of 19, and I mean, that's where my, I wanted my base case to be, you see. So if I do basic induction applied to P tilde is the same thing as taking the base case for this statement as 19, K equals 1, and just going forward. So um, that's, that's all legit, and it's, ha it's handled in the the notes I posted, so if you read some of those. 
Another one in the back. Okay. <laughs> um, I tend to change colors when we change uh, topics or questions or something just to make it a little bit easier. I get bored with just black and red seems very aggressive and uh, blue is Michigan, it should be copacetic. But yellow doesn't show up so we can't, or maize doesn't show up so yeah, so the question was do I, have, is there rhyme or reason to my um, color scheme and it's mostly rhyme, very little reason but yeah. Hey. Okay, ready for the second principle of induction? And we have to stop at, in 15 uh, minutes. Okay. Boom. So this is sometimes goes under the word strong induction. Okay. <clears throat> Let's do it. Okay. So let P of N be a statement. about the natural numbers. Same thing as counting numbers. Oh, whoops, we always with the following properties. Okay, the change is slightly. case. P of 1 is true. So just like in ordinary induction or the first principle of induction, we're still working with n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and we need to first start with the base case. Whether your base is 4, 100, but we'll assume it's 1 just for simplicity. And then B, this is what at first drives people crazy. If P of J is true for all J bigger than 1, less than or equal to K, then P of K plus 1 is true. Then P of N is true for all N bigger than or equal to 1. Okay, we'll discuss it a little bit, do an example, finish up for today. So, what is different between this and ordinary induction? Normally, when you're trying to show that this one is true, you only get to look at the previous hypothesis. If the one two steps back would be helpful, can't do it, okay? Not allowed in ordinary induction, okay? This one says, look, if I'm trying to assume this is true, and I'm using P of K, look, guys, we're doing induction. It must be that all the others are working out too, so why not go back and fish around and use those facts, okay? I'm giving myself more freedom 
I can go back and use all of the hypotheses associated with P of n for all the j's from the base case up to the previous one. So the difference is this is ordinary induction, and you get to go back and use extras when you do strong induction. Okay, we'll do an example that straightens this out. Facts. Two induction methods are equivalent. Sometimes um, the second one is easier to apply. Okay. Let me give you a hint as to why they're equivalent, then we'll do the example. This symbol equals and, as in P1 and P2 is P1 and P2. So when is the statement P1 and P2, when is that statement true? When they're both true. And if I do three of them, when is that true? But all three are true. So, do this, okay? Let P tilde of K equals P of one and P of two and dot, 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 and P of K, okay? Now, do ordinary induction on P tilde of K. This is fun to think about, and we'll do the example, at least part way. But what is the base case of P tilde of K? It's just P of 1. It's the same as the other one, okay? Now, when I'm trying to prove P tilde of K implies P tilde of K plus 1, what information do I have at my hand when I assume P tilde of K is true? I have every one of these is true, okay? And when I'm trying to show P tilde of K plus 1 is true, What's the extra thing I'm trying to do? It's just the P of K plus one, okay? So they're equivalent, you see? But the act of writing it down in terms of this logical statement or this one will be easier in some cases, but they're exactly the same, okay? Exactly the same. It's how you organize your thought process. That's all it is. It's just how you organize your thought process. Is that cool? Oh, okay. Finally did something interesting for the day. Okay. Example. Um, natural number. Excuse me, I leave out things. N greater than or equal to two is composite if there exist two other natural numbers C 
such that n is equal to their product, and neither of these numbers is equal to 1. So a and b have to be bigger than 2, and they're smaller than or equal to n minus 1. Oh, how did that happen? That was exciting. Otherwise, n is prime. Okay, in this course, we don't care about number theory at all, okay? Could care less about it, but my assumption is all of us know how to add and multiply, and so defining an odd number, an even number, a prime number, and a composite number is within our capabilities. We're just using those as examples, okay, that are common to whether you're from aerospace or electrical. It's all because you went to fourth grade, okay? That's, that's all we're drawing upon, basically. So um, let's make a note. One is neither prime. One is neither prime nor composite. Neither prime nor composite. <clears throat> okay, so a number is prime if I can't factor it. That's what the definition is here, okay? So composite numbers I can factor. But I'm not allowed to use one as a factor, because otherwise I just put one, 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 and I, it's, it's, it's stupid, okay? So primes are ones I cannot factor. When I can factor them, the name is composite. So if you want to call those factorable numbers, um, it's, it's true. So here's the theorem. And I think we don't have time for the proof. Fundamental theorem of arithmetic. natural number n greater than or equal to 2 can be written as a product of one or more primes. Okay, so we'll do the proof um, next time. I invite you to just try to sketch it out, okay? Then you can see if your proof is better than my proof. That's fine, okay? Um, so I'm gonna stop here and then